Welcome back to the Shores Church Online. It's great to be with you today. Whether you are listening on Spotify, watching on YouTube or Facebook or any other means, whether you're in your living room or you're on a run, we're just so grateful that you've chosen to spend a few moments with us today at the Shores Church. Today we're continuing our series in Corinthians. We are now in the second half of this study. We're in the book of 2 Corinthians, and today we'll be looking at chapter 1 and 2. I want to give you a little bit of background on 2 Corinthians. Obviously, you can go back to our very first message in this series and hear the overall background on the church in Corinth. But for this particular book, now we've, we've had something happen between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that there's some false teachers that have entered in. They've stirred up the people against Paul, and we'll hear that as we go through this book. They have claimed that he's fickle, that he's proud, that he's unimpressive in appearance and unqualified as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he's fighting some of these thoughts and uh, feelings that people have within the church towards him. And so he's trying to find this mixture of qualifying himself while ultimately allowing Christ to be the one who qualifies him. That he's expressing his thanksgiving for the repetitive attitude of the people from the first letter. And that ultimately he is trying to appeal to these rebellious members of the church to convince them of his authority in Jesus Christ and allow them to see that he has the authority to do and say what God is having him do and say. This letter was delivered by Titus and another brother who brought 2 Corinthians to the church in Corinth. So we're going to get ready to deep dive into these two chapters. Uh, but before we do, would you just go ahead and repeat with me this morning? Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. So this morning, let's go ahead and we're going to just jump into 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. So would you read this with me this morning? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt like we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. The first point that I want to bring up in this passage today is simply this, that God is the God of all comfort. God is the God of all comfort. And I want to illustrate this with, with an idea this morning. I'm a Detroit sports fan. I've lived in Michigan my entire life. I've lived in the metro Detroit area my entire life. That I'm a ride or die Detroit fan, whether it be Tigers, Lions, Pistons, or Red Wings. Those are my four teams. I, my, my college team is Michigan Wolverines. And my college that I also root for is Eastern Michigan because that's where I attended before I did my credentialing with the Assemblies of God through Green and Global University. And I did it online. But when I was in middle school, I was also a Seattle Mariners fan. Not because I had some loyalty to Seattle, not because I lived in Seattle or I had family members that lived in Seattle. I was a Seattle Mariners fan for one reason, and it's because of the best swing in Major League Baseball history, Ken Griffey Jr. He was my favorite baseball player for years. I had his shoes, I had a jersey, 
I would wake up every morning and open up the newspaper to see how they did the day before. And oftentimes I couldn't get the results because their game ran so late, the newspaper had already been printed. So I was following him, but this was also in the height of the whole home run chase that was happening with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. And so I always loved watching what were his stats, how did he do, did his team win, and how many home runs did he hit? I was a Seattle Mariners fan until he left Seattle and he went to Cincinnati. Then I became a Cincinnati Reds fan. And it wasn't anything to do with Seattle or Cincinnati. I still, in my this point in my life, have never been to Seattle. I've been to Cincinnati, but I, I can't really tell you, like, oh, I love the city of Cincinnati. No, I love the team because I love Ken Griffey Jr. That I was also an Indianapolis Colts fan for a while. Despite being a Detroit Lions fan, I picked my AFC team simply because I was a fan of one of the smartest, most intelligent quarterbacks that has ever existed in the NFL, Peyton Manning. When he left the Indianapolis Colts and went to the Denver Broncos, I became a Denver Broncos fan. I got the root for the, the Colts and the Broncos as they won Super Bowls. But ultimately, my loyalty, my allegiance falls with the Detroit Lions. As bad as they are, it falls there because I'm a bandwagon fan for some of these other teams when they're a favorite player. If my team's not doing good, I'm going to root for a favorite player and their team as well so I can see them have some success. But here's the thing you got to realize that when you're a bandwagon fan in a different city, one of the things that happens is if that team wins a championship, you've got nobody to root with. You see, when the Red Wings finished their drought and they won their first Stanley Cup back in 97, I was able to celebrate with all of my friends and my family at school because our team did something. But when the Denver Broncos won that Super Bowl, I had no one to really celebrate with because I'm not from Denver. I have no family in Denver, that I have no friends that are living in Denver. And I was just kind of rooting for him because I like the player. I was a bandwagon fan. The difference between the two is Detroit fans, whether it's a high moment or a low moment, I'm a Detroit fan. I will always be a Detroit fan because Detroit is where I'm from. This is the area, the proximity. I mean, my house in here in St. Clair Shores is only a couple miles from Detroit that this, this is the area that I grew up in. These are my teams, whether we're in high moments or low moments. When we're in high moments as Detroit fans, we cheer together. When we're in low moments, we mourn and cry together. When it's really low moments, we all call for the coach's uh, job together. We do all these different things together and we're in it together. We're comforted when the highs are high and we're sorrowful together when the lows are low. And ultimately, that's really what Paul's getting at in this passage is that when we're on Team Jesus, when we're on God's side, we will suffer together, but ultimately we will find comfort together because God is our comfort. That we don't want to be bandwagon Christians. That we even see a play out in Revelation where uh, we are told that we are to not be lukewarm, that we should be hot or we should be cold because God is going to spit the lukewarm out of his mouth. That we don't want to be this kind of, uh, are they, they're a bandwagon fan. They're kind of on the team, but they're kind of not. No, I want a full commitment to God's team that even if the, the moments in the highs are not as high as I would like them to be, I'm still on the team. If the, the highs are extremely high and it's a great moment, I'm on the team. I want to always be on the team to the point where people look at him and say, like, he's a super fan. That This guy, he gets it. He loves what he's doing. He loves his Lord and Savior. He, he is pro-God and he loves other people in the process. I want to be a real fan of Christianity and that in those moments when things fall apart in my life, I know where I can go for my comfort. I find my comfort in God, not in the things of this world, not in other people. I find it in God so that when I walk through sufferings and I walk through trials, I go to God. I know where I can go to on a continual basis. And that is what Paul is getting at here is that he wants to have the people in, in Corinth you got to be so on fire for God that you are doing what God has called you to do so that you can walk out the path that he has for you. When we're fully on God's team, here's the thing you got to realize is at the end of the day, at the end of the game, we know that our team wins. That's what makes it so great. That's what makes it so amazing is that one, there's room for everybody on the team because Jesus came to die for all, not just me and not just you, but he came to die for all, that all could experience the, the repentance, all could experience the salvation 
that it's not just for one person or two people, it's for everybody if they so choose to believe in Jesus Christ. So there's plenty of room on the team for everybody, but we know at the end of the book, at the end of Revelation, that our team wins. So you may feel like, oh, I'm in a, in a low moment right now. I'm, I'm in a sorrowful moment right now. Our team wins. You can take comfort in the fact that our team wins. So God is the God of all comfort because he already has won. Trust in him, rest in him, that God is the God of comfort and he is going to take care of you. Now that leads perfectly now into our second point, which is following God will lead to some uncomfortable moments but God is still your comfort. Hear that again. I know it's a little bit of a mouthful. Following God will lead to some uncomfortable moments, but God is still your comfort. We're going to read now 2 Corinthians 1, verses 16 through 2, 4. So let's read this together. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanius and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory." And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. And who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. For I made it up in my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you." If you remember what I said earlier, Paul was being criticized for being fickle and proud and unimpressive in appearance and unqualified as an apostle of Jesus Christ. You see that play out in this passage a little bit, that Paul is trying to explain why he didn't come back a second time. After 1 Corinthians, he passed through on the way to Macedonia, but that visit didn't go so good. And when he left Macedonia, he made the intentional decision to not go back. And instead of going back, he sent this letter in 2 Corinthians. And so there's individuals who were criticizing him because they, they made the statement, well, Paul said he was going to come back, and now he's not coming back. He's not a man of his word. He's sending this letter, but he's not a man of his word because he's not doing what he said he was going to do. And you even see it kind of play out here that ultimately it's not about my yes or my no. It's about Jesus' yes and what Jesus has called us to do. And he really realizes this and wrestles with it and struggles with it and realize he caused some issues when he was there. It was painful for him. It was painful for the people. And so he made the decision that it was in the best interest right here and right now to send this letter, but to not return. He's being criticized for being a man of not of his word, but he had good reason. And it wasn't that he lacked love for them or lacked joy for them or didn't care about them. He didn't come back because he didn't want the cause that further pain. He sought God and he realized it wasn't time. You'll notice that he begins to identify the why, but he doesn't become defensive. One of the things that we need to, to realize is that we're going to go through moments in our life, moments in our journey with, with Christ, where we're uncomfortable. And we got to wrestle with these uncomfortable moments, but we remember that God is our comfort. So even when we find ourselves in an uncomfortable moment, like Paul is finding right now, that he wants to do this, but it doesn't feel right, that he's got to wrestle with it. And then you go to the God of comfort for that explanation, for that help. Well, what do I do in this particular moment? He realizes it's not going to be helpful. And he realizes, well, let me do something a little bit different in order that they would experience what they need to from God the Father, that it's more about the relationship with God the Father in, in Jesus Christ than it is between them and Paul. So that's how he's building his case. But he's being intentional to not be defensive here. 
Nothing that he's writing is making it sound like, well, let me explain that why I, I did what I did. It's just a matter of saying, I'm like, God told me not to come, that I didn't want to cause you pain. He kept it very, very simple. One of the things I want you to realize is a pastor of a church, and I've been a pastor in some capacity between kids ministry, youth ministry, lead pastor now for 13 years of my life. I'm, I'm approaching that halfway point of half of my life being in ministry. And during that time, I've had people be mad at me. And sometimes it's with good reason. Sometimes it's just because they want to be mad at me. I've had people criticize me. And sometimes they're justified and sometimes they're, they're, they're not. The uh, very first sermon I ever preached in an adult service, I had somebody tell me that they were going to next time hold up a sign to tell me to slow down because I was preaching too quickly. That you get some of these criticisms as a pastor that are thrown at you. You get some hate that's thrown at you. I've been in meetings where people have broken down in tears because of decisions that I've made. I've had meetings where people have yelled at me. And I've had meetings that I've walked into having fasted and prayed because I'm prepared to be just cussed out. I remember one in particular and I'm preparing to go in and be the representation of Jesus Christ to these people, whether they're going to yell at me, whether they're going to cry at me, whether they're happy with me, whether they're sad with me, whether they're angry with me, whatever the emotion is, I have to realize that I cannot defend myself because Christ is my defender and I find my comfort in Christ, not in me, not my justification of my behavior, not my justification of my actions, but I find my comfort in God. That God will allow me to go into uncomfortable situations, but he will provide me comfort as I navigate those difficult waters. That now leads to the third point this morning, that we must be agents of comfort to comfort the uncomfortable. Hear that one again. We must be agents of comfort to comfort the uncomfortable. If God has got a comfort and we are a new creation in Jesus Christ, and we are in Christ and we are hidden in Christ, that means we need to look more like Jesus. And Jesus is one with the Father. That, that means when we look like Jesus, we look more like God the Father as well. And if God has got a comfort as an agent, as a Christian, that we need to be bringing that comfort to other people. It's part of our journey. Just as we show Christ's love to others, we need to show this comfort to other people as well. And we need to go and comfort the uncomfortable. And sometimes it's that moment where it's visiting somebody who's in jail and loving on them and, and showing them grace and showing them mercy. That might be giving the cup of cold water to someone who is thirsty. It might be clothing uh, the, the homeless. It might be taking care of the elderly. It might be a, a whole bunch of different things. But sometimes it's that matter of going and comforting the person that's angry and mad at you. And this is what Paul is kind of to navigating here is that there's issues that are going on that need to be addressed, and he doesn't want to just stir things up. But he gets into something very particular when we hit 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. I want you to hear this this morning. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excess sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Now, according to scripture in biblical scholars, this passage is likely referencing one of two scenarios. The first scenario would take us back to 1 Corinthians 5, when we were discussing the individual, the, the man that was sleeping with his stepmother, that the first thought is the people of the Corinthian church got their act together, went after the situation and addressed it and held them accountable and this is what he's that Paul's referencing. The other thought that comes into play is that this is an individual that's involved with some kind of rebellion against Paul, against the authority that he's bringing, and is causing a schism. It's causing a division within the church and the authority of Paul's apostleship, and that it's created issues in the church, and the church is trying to hold this individual responsible. 
or it could be another situation. But ultimately, what we need to know is that this is a sin issue that's going on. The church has definitely learned their lesson from 1 Corinthians 5, and now they're holding people accountable for when they do things that hurt the church. And what Paul is saying here is, regardless of who it is and regardless of the sin issue, that Paul is saying, good job for doing what you did, but now you need to back off a little bit. You're going too aggressive. You're going too strong. You need to make sure that he doesn't just flee the church, but that if he is repentant, if he's been held accountable, now we need to show him love. This is the thing that I say a lot, is that Christians need to do a better job of not just showing truth and not just showing uh, the love, but showing truth in love, bring those two things together, that we're either good at one of the one or the other, realistically. Like We know God's word, we're going to quote God's word, and we're just going to tell people, this is where you're wrong because this is what God's word says. We share all of our knowledge, we share how much we know before we share how much we care. And people don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. And the, the flip side of it is that all we do is show love, we just make a nice, easy path to hell. Think about that for a moment. When we just show love, but we don't show the truth that you have to change, we make the pathway to hell a little bit nicer, but ultimately we don't change that eternal destination. When we look at the case of Jesus, every single time he calls out the people that are just sharing truth and saying that you're not identifying with me, get it together. And when he looks at people that are in sin, he loves on them, but says, go and sin no more. And we lose sight of that within Christianity because we have these two polar extremes when in reality, Jesus operated in the middle and he gave to each person as they needed the right balance between truth and love. Some people need a little bit more truth. Some people need a little bit more love, but they need them both. And so Paul is really getting at that with them is great job giving the truth, but now we need to insert that love. You kind of swing the pendulum too far and now we need to bring it back so that he'll be brought back in to the fold to bring that good balance. I want to give you kind of an explanation of this is to kind of test yourself. If you never tell the truth of scripture, maybe because you don't even spend time in scripture, reading scripture, getting to know God's word, then you need to spend time in this because if you're going to say, well, Jesus would never do that. Really? Because that's not what this book says. Read this, this entire Bible, read the, the gospels, read the book of Revelation that says Jesus is coming back as with a sword coming out of his mouth, that when Jesus comes back again, he is coming back and he's meaning it, and that there is going to be a price to pay if you don't have a relationship with him because you've had the opportunity to, that he shows love, but ultimately truth is going to come out and truth is going to win one day. At the same time, if you fall on the side of, of truth and this kind of extremism on that side, I want you to do me a favor. Is either do one of two things. Go to somebody that you, you trust and ask, how well do I represent Christ? And then allow them the opportunity to be truthful. Demand that they will be truthful with you, even if it's hurtful or painful. And if you don't necessarily have somebody that you feel like you can do that with, here's a good test for you, especially if you're on social media. Go look at the last 30 or 40 posts that you have put up on Facebook or on Twitter, um, especially those two where you have a more written form of dialogue. And I want you to read the tone in which you say things or the tone of the, the pictures, the memes, whatever it is that you're sharing. Does it represent Christ well? Read the words that you're sharing. Does this reflect Jesus? Would Jesus post that picture? It might be funny, but would Jesus post that? Is it tearing people down? Because if it is, likely Jesus wouldn't share that. I, I feel pretty confident saying that. But then also, in those last 30 or 40 posts, run a, a little like column and say, this one brings life, this one brings truth, this one shares the good news of Jesus Christ, or could be even categorized in this would be a loving people type of, of post, and then put how many are derogatory, how many tear people down, how many have no eternal merit. And look at it and say, like, you know what, if my ratio is 30 uh, out of 40 are political, they're attacks, they're not loving, they're not life-giving, and 5 to 10 of them are, your ratio is off. You're not representing Christ well. We need to, not that every post needs to be and every conversation you have with people needs to be directly about Jesus, but we need to create an atmosphere in which people can hear the gospel from us and that they can be around us and know that we're Christians 
and that they know something's different. One of the things, and sometimes it drives me crazy because people act differently around me. They hear that I'm a pastor and then instantly they, they change their actions. They change their words. They change uh, what they are willing to share. That's why a lot of times I don't lead with, oh yeah, I'm a pastor because I want people to be real around me. I don't want people to feel like, well, I can't be myself because then I feel like I'm this alien of, well, yeah, now, now I don't fit in. But it allows me to talk with them, to have real conversation. And then when they find out that I'm a pastor, they kind of get uh, twisted a little bit. I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, it's good. Like, we're good. It doesn't matter that you, you swore at me in conversation. Like, I love you because God loves you. Like, this is where you are in your journey. And I believe God has a good uh, way to take you. But he has a good way to take me too. And so we want to be real people that love people, that are encouraging people that it doesn't matter what the belief structure is now, as long as the belief structure is moving in the direction towards Christ. Don't expect people to be perfect when they first come in the mix. And so just like this, this section, like we need to be willing to be agents of comfort for those who need comfort. That might mean that it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, but God is our comfort. So we know where we get our comfort from and we can help pass that comfort on to those who are uncomfortable to bring them into right relationship with God the Father. Now that brings us to our last point for today, and that's Christ triumphs in comfort. Christ triumphs in comfort. And so we're going to be looking now at 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. So I want you to go ahead and read this with me as we hear our last point today, that Christ triumphs in comfort. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal pr procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Hear that for a moment. We are the aroma of Christ. The church, the body of Christ, is the aroma of Christ to a world that will either accept Christ or they'll perish. Think of that word aroma for a moment. When you're in a coffee shop, you smell the coffee. You don't go into a, a coffee shop expecting to smell fruit. You, you walk in expecting to smell coffee. I had a roommate in college that worked at a Starbucks and that when he came back, regardless or not, if he had drank coffee on his shift, he smelled like coffee. Instantly, our apartment, the, the aroma in the apartment changed from college guy, whatever that smells like, to coffee shop. It was an instantaneous thing because as he walked into the room, everything changed. Your, your nose just picked up that something different entered into the room. Another comparison is this. In college, I took a Culture in the Holocaust class. And then post-college, I had an opportunity to go on uh, a mission trip to Poland. And part of that mission trip is they took us to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz being the main uh, concentration camp, Birkenau being the spot where they were sent prior to being uh, placed to death. And walking through that concentration camp and realizing how many Jewish prisoners had walked through both of those areas and ultimately had been put to death, that getting the opportunity to walk in to a, a gas chamber and to the, the bunk houses, and it was an experience. Like I knew for my culture in the Holocaust class what to expect but I arrived and I didn't know what to expect. There was a presence, there was an aroma of death and despair that I can't describe. That even just thinking about it, it takes me back, but I can't describe it. It's something you have to experience because there's an aroma, there's an atmosphere there of death. And so when we think of this passage that we are the aroma of Christ, we are the ones who bring an atmosphere of Jesus into the rooms that we enter in, when we do that, we realize the fact that anywhere we go, we are bringing Jesus Christ or we're bringing something that doesn't matter. It's the reason why I feel like I have to come again and again and say the things that we post on social media matter. 
The things that we say matter. The shows that we watch matter. All of these things matter. And you may think, well, it's my right. I, I'm not sinning by doing this. I get it. I hear you. You very well may not be sinning. But the thing that we need to realize is that we are the aroma of Christ to a world that is lost. But Christ triumphs in comfort. So when we are the aroma that we begin to bring comfort because we're agents of comfort to the uncomfortable. We bring comfort into the room. When we bring it into the room, the atmosphere changes, the smell changes, the experience change. We can bring hope, we can bring love, we can bring life, we can bring joy, we can bring peace, we can bring patience, we can bring all of the, the fruit of the Spirit. We can change the atmosphere in the room because the aroma changes and people realize there's something different here. There, there's something different because we are the aroma of Jesus Christ. And when we walk around, people should be able to know that Jesus just walked in the room. So let's let's go through those, those points again for a moment. The idea that God is the God of all comfort, that we find comfort in Jesus Christ, that we then move to this idea that we're going to be led into some uncomfortable situations sometimes, that just because we're a Christian doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect, that everything is going to be glorious, but that as we're led into uncomfortable situations, that God continues to be our comfort because he is the comfort of all, that we are then agents to bring that comfort that we've been given to the uncomfortable, because that's one of the parts of being uncomfortable as a Christian is having to go into uncomfortable situations so that we can bring comfort to those that are uncomforted. And that ultimately, when we do this, we become the aroma of Christ. We bring an atmosphere into the room and that Christ will triumph in that comfort because he is going to win. Because God is God. The story is written. We are on God's team. And like I said earlier, we know that God's team wins at the end. We don't want to be a bandwagon fan of God's team. We want to be firmly on team with Jesus. So this morning, what I want to do as we go to close is I want to pray for comfort in your life. You may be listening today and you feel like I've got no comfort. I've got no sense of peace. And I want to pray that over you because I firmly believe from this passage that God is the God of all comfort and he can bring that on you today. But also, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, you are an agent of comfort for others, and that you can be that aroma that walks into a room and changes the atmosphere in that room. And I want to pray that over for you. Not only will you have comfort for your life, but you will be an agent of comfort for others. Let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends this morning as they hear this message that if there is anything in their life right now that they are struggling with, that they are in a, a place of uncomfortability, Lord, that you would just step in. Not necessarily that everything would be made perfect right now, that there might still be some sufferings. But Lord, as we suffer alongside other believers, Lord, that we are ultimately comforted alongside them as well. Lord, we know that at the end of the day, at the end of the book, that you win. So Lord, we can be comforted in the fact that even if I go through a struggle now, I know in the end I win because I'm on team Jesus. So Lord, give my friends rest, give them peace, give them patience through the journey, God, so that they can experience the comfort that is God the Father. And ultimately, Lord, as we look more like Jesus, we become those agents of comfort as well, that we can go into places that are uncomfortable, that are difficult, and we can meet with people that are in pain, that they're in suffering, they have no hope, and we can bring comfort to them. Lord, that we would be the aroma of Christ, that we would walk into the room and everything would change, that we would walk in the room and people would just say, what just happened? The atmosphere just changed. The presence just changed. There's no longer a presence of death, but there is a presence of life and excitement. And I want that so that we can bring comfort to them because ultimately we know that Jesus triumphs in comfort. So Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Give us comfort so that we can give comfort to others. In Jesus' incredible name, amen. Well, this morning as we go to close, would you repeat the Great Commission with me this morning? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Thanks again for taking a few moments to be with us today. Whether you're watching on Spotify, Facebook, uh, YouTube, however you're, you're joining us today, would you just take that moment, like, subscribe, uh, make sure you get any notifications so that you always hear when we launch our next message. We are so grateful. Check out myshores.church to see what's going on with the church and your opportunity to give and support us as we continue to do God's work in St. Clair Shores, Michigan and around the world. Have a blessed day and I will see you next time. Thank you.